We're live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, fan base. Tonight's lecture, ooh, seed time and harvest. Oh, yes. Although it bears the same title as my latest book, it is not to be found in that book, for that book is an attempt to interpret some of the more difficult passages of the Bible. I have given you in the nine chapters a mystical view and also a certain approach. How you yourself may approach the interpretation of the Bible, for as you know, it is not a book of history. And so when I became aware of deeper meanings in the passages that those normally assign to them, I began to see them or to apprehend them mystically. And so I have given you a mystical interpretation of many of the darker passages. For instance, when Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon, he made himself. No one made it for him. Well, that's what we do. That's what you must do. That's what I must do. That's what everyone must do. And in that chapter, I showed you the wood is not wood as you know wood. It means the wood of Lebanon is the incorruptible mind. But you make it for yourself. And we showed you the sides, what they were made of, and what the meanings really are. Then we took that very strange passage, passage, the instruction of the disciples to take off their shoes or provide no shoes when they travel. And we showed you the word shoe is not just the thing I wear on my foot. It is the symbol of the spirit of let me do it for you. For the shoe takes upon itself not only the dirt and the muck that would normally fall upon the wearer's foot, but it protects the wearer from any contact with the outer world. And so anyone who offers to do for us what we should do and could do far better ourselves is offering himself as our shoe. And if I would awaken spiritually, I must do it for myself. I must take my own mind and control it. Take my wonderful imagination and actually control it and set it to noble purposes and not have some intermediary come between myself and God. For the God of this world is an internal God. He is that inevitable force that expresses in outward facts the latent tendencies of the soul. And so if I will discover that God, I if I would discover that God, I cannot have you do my work for me. I cannot have you eat my spiritual food and expect to grow spiritually. So that is really the attempt of the nine chapters in the book, Seed Time and Harvest. But tonight's subject, I want to approach it differently. This statement is taken from the book of Genesis, the eighth chapter of Genesis. It is a promise made to man that while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, hot and cold, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. We are told that man was placed in a garden. The garden was completed. Every tree was bearing fruit. Everything in the world was finished, and he was placed in the garden to dress it and to keep it. He doesn't plant it. He doesn't do a thing but dress it and keep it. He is not called upon to make trees or to grow new trees. Everything is finished. As we are told in John, I have sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. For creation is finished. Every conceivable human drama, every little plot, Every little plan in the drama of life is already worked out as mere possibilities while we are not in them. But they are overpoweringly real when we are in them. So man can get in touch with that particular state of his choice. For my imagination can put me in touch inwardly with the state desired so I am in it. All right? For my imagination can put me in touch inwardly with the state 
desired. So I put myself in it. Well, if I am in it, I will realize it in my world. The states in which we find ourselves are the seed time. The harvest is simply the encountering of events and circumstances of life. But you see, man's memory is so short. He forgets the seed time, but all ends run true to origins. So if the origin, say, is misfortune, the end will be misfortune. But when you reap misfortune, you wonder, <laughs> why should it happen to me? Then have I set a thing like that in motion? Haven't I given to the poor? Haven't I attended service? Well, haven't I prayed daily? And why should these things happen? But you see, my God never forgets because he always gives the end in harmony with the origin. And you and I are the selectors. We don't make, we are not creators. Creation is finished. The whole vast world of creation has told us in Ecclesiastes, I am the beginning and the end. There is nothing to come that has not been and is. So look upon creation as finished. And you and I are only selectors of that which is. By selectors, I mean that you and I have the privilege. We may not exercise it, but it is our privilege to select that aspect of reality to which we will respond. And in responding to it, we bring it into existence for ourselves. Not knowing that we are so privileged, we simply go through the world reflecting the circumstances of life, not realizing we have the power to create or to outpicture the circumstances of life. So let us now analyze what I personally mean by seed time. If everything is finished and completed, then why the promise there shall be seed time and harvest as long as the earth remains? Now, seed time to those who are here tonight, as we should really know, we are not taking it literally. Our seed time is that moment in time when you and I react to anything in this world. It may be to an object. It may be to an individual. It may be to a bit of news that we have overheard. <sighs> but the moment of reaction, that emotional response, is our attitude. Our attitudes are the seed times of life. And although we may not remember the seed time or the moment of response, nature never forgets. And when it suddenly appears in our world, that suddenness is only the emergence of a hidden continuity. It was continuous from the moment of reaction until it appeared in the world. Its appearance in the world is harvest. So you and I may harvest anything we desire, but we must first have a seed time. It must be preceded by a moment of response or an attitude. How often you say, well, I approached it in the wrong attitude or well, he's in the wrong attitude or you must change your attitude if you would get on in this life. I've said it. You've said it. Maybe we have said it to each other. But we know the importance of right attitude. We know this much. That I can change my attitude if circumstances change. Well, that's automatic. We know that if something happens suddenly in my world of which up to that moment I was not aware, I, becoming aware of a change of circumstance, would automatically produce in myself a change of attitude. We all do that. Morning, noon, and night. But that's not important. That is a reflect of life. 99% of the world reflects life. Now, can I consciously, can I voluntarily, can I deliberately produce in myself a change of attitude, one of my own discretion, one that I myself single out, and not one that is determined by or in any way is dependent on a stimulus of a change in the object itself? Must you change before I will change my attitude towards you. 
We know that if you do change, I will change my attitude towards you. But must I go through life simply reflecting these changes in the objects? And can I not deliberately determine the change prior to the change in the object? For if I can, I am moving towards complete control of my fate and becoming the master of my fate if I can assume an active positive attitude and not depend upon changes in the object for changes in myself. If I can do it, I really am. If not a complete master, I am becoming more in control of the circumstances of life. But 99% of the world waits for things to happen on the outside and then they reflect. Well, that's no accomplishment at all. If we would awaken and become real selectors of the beauty of this garden that God gave us so that we can single out that particular aspect to which we will respond, well, then we will do it by deliberately changing our attitude towards life itself. There's a little fable given to us to, sh to show us how it is done. If you will study the fable carefully, you will see the importance of imagination. The fable is of the fox and the grapes. <laughs> you all know it. When he failed to obtain the grapes, then he persuaded himself that the grapes were sour. And by imagining the grapes to be sour, he evoked in himself change of attitude. He no longer felt about the grapes as he formerly felt. Now, that's a little fable on a negative tone or a tragic tone. You and I take the same story, but now we put it on a positive tone. We contemplate our ambitious dream, our noble concept of life. It may seem we haven't the talents to realize it. Instead of saying what the fox did, that the thing is beyond us, and therefore it is sour anyway, we can take the same technique and wonder what it would be like had we realized it. What would the feeling be like were we, and we name what that is, if I can contemplate what the feeling would be like were I the man that I want to be, were you the person that you want to be, and rejoice in that state as though it were true. Well, I am producing in myself that emotional response necessary for seed time. I may not see an immediate harvest. Maybe the thing that I am now giving expression to in the form of seed time is an oak. It is not a little mushroom that would grow overnight. Maybe my dream would take a little longer interval of time between the actual planting and the reaping. But if I know that all these things are consistent. See yonder fields. The sesame was sesame. The corn was corn. The silence and the darkness knew. So is a man's fate born. So if that moment of response is the actual planting of the seed, and if it was corn, it must be corn when it appears in harvest time, then I can select the nature of the things I want to encounter in my world. And I can take not just Neville as a man, I can take the request first of my circle, my intimate circle as a family man, my wife's desires for her child, for her husband, for herself, the child's desires for itself, and move beyond my little circle as a family man into the circle of friendships, move beyond that into my acquaintances, move beyond that into total strangers, impersonal states, but if I know the law holds good, no matter when I operate it, if I do it unconsciously or consciously, you get results regardless. And the results are in harmony with the planting, with the actual seed time. Now, what is now our seed time today? There are maybe 2,000 odd people here. We have 2,000 odd different requests multiplied by a large number because we have requests for others. But you can take today as you sit here and you can actually contemplate what it would be like. Suppose it were true. 
Suppose I could turn now to a friend and rejoice with him because of his good fortune and actually carry on a mental conversation with him from the premise that he or she has already realized the dream. Now, as I do it in my imagination, I am setting up within myself a certain changed attitude in regard to that individual. I am producing within myself a certain positive, deliberate, emotional response. And that very moment that I do is seed time. I will encounter that individual tomorrow or next week or next month, and he will bear witness of that thing I plant now. He may be totally unaware that I planted in this garden. I'm not seeking his praise. I'm not seeking credit. I'm seeking results. If I see the man become the embodiment of the success I know that he desires, and I desire for him, well, that's praise enough. That's payment enough. What more payment would anyone desire other than the results for everything as a gift? Why should I be given more? My father gave me the garden. The whole thing is in complete and full bloom and gave me choice, the greatest gift of all, complete freedom of choice of the nature of the fruit I will reap in my world. But I cannot just barge into the garden and start picking fruit. There must be a seed time. But I must always bear in mind, I will reap that whereon I bestowed no labor. I don't labor to make it so. I simply plant it. For in that moment of response is contained all the plans, all the energy necessary to unfold that plan into a perfect, wonderful, objective fact, which I will then harvest by becoming aware of it as an external reality. But I don't labor to make it so. I simply must know it is so. So that is our privilege. That is our choice. If you believe it, aren't you amazed at the kind of things that you planted? At the kind of seed time that in our ignorance, in our sleep, we allowed to actually scatter in our world? You see, some will say, but why does God allow it? You cannot conceive of an infinite God that is not infinite in every respect. If I was incapable, actually incapable of assuming, say, an unlovely state, I could not be my father's son, because my father is infinite. And if he were actually incapable of assuming any state, then he would not be God. Everything is within me. Everything. You cannot conceive of something that I don't contain. The most horrible thing in the world, were it not so, I could not be infinite and therefore not the son of my infinite father. So God is infinite and gave us everything. But he gave us freedom of choice that we may become selective, discriminative and bring out everything that is beautiful out of that garden. If I took the piano, the 88 notes of the piano, if I could extract from that piano keyboard every discord, I would not have a piano keyboard. If I could strike a discord and because it frightens me or it disturbs me, the thing grates upon my nerves. If I could now extract the notes that produce the discord and then keep on extracting the notes that produce the discord, I would remove the 88 notes. There would be no notes left on which I could play tomorrow's harmony. But let me leave the notes and learn the art of playing the piano so I can, from the same 88 notes, bring out all the harmonies of the world. The same thing is true of man. Instead of looking at someone and accepting as final the evidence of the senses, there is someone who brought out into his own world, say, disease. He is trying to analyze it from the outside. 
When did I contract the bug? When did I come in close contact with someone who had the bug? And are they taking me into the laboratory with my blood and try to find it there? You will never find it there, in spite of all the wisdom of man. You will find it only in the consciousness of the individual who, at a moment now long forgotten, planted the thing he is now harvesting. And you are not going to find it in any external analysis at all. Because things seen were never made of things that do appear. Well, you are warned time and time again in all the books of the Bible, but especially in that 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, that things seen were made of things that do not appear. But no man believes it. He insists on finding it in things seen. So he extracts my blood. He extracts a little piece of my skin. And he starts to make an analysis of that. And he will tell me, yes, he has found it. It's in my blood. I am not denying he has found it in my blood. But why is it in my blood? It is in my blood or in my body or in my world. Because at some point in time, I exercising the right as a free child of God, singled out some unlovely state relative to another. It need not be to myself. It could be to another, wherein I rejoiced in the hurt of another, where my emotional response to the news I heard was good. So I set it in motion. But when it happened in my world, I did not think it was so good, but it was my harvest. And all these things are the harvest of things you and I have planted. For all things run true to form. Don't be surprised at the suddenness in our world. Someone is ill. It is only sudden because we have forgotten and man's memory is very, very short. You know that lovely little poem of George Meredith? Forgetful is green earth. The gods alone remember everlastingly. They strike remorselessly and ever like for like. But their great memories, by their great memories, the gods are known. If man could only remember these moments of seed time, he would never be surprised when the harvest appears in his world. But because he has no memory as to that moment, in time when he dropped that seed which is simply his emotional response to something he contemplated something he overheard something he observed at that moment the thing was done he didn't have to labor to bring it to harvest he simply encountered it as something already full grown so he reaps now that on which he bestowed no labor outside of choice he selected it by his attitude, by his reaction. Now I am responsible for others in my world. <laughs> I certainly am. When I take my little mind, my little imagination, and think because it's mine, well, my father gave it to me, that I can simply misuse it. It isn't going to hurt another. I tell you, you do have to use more control for the simple reason I am rooted in you and you are rooted in everyone and all of us are rooted in God. There is no separate individual detached being in my father's kingdom. We are one. I am completely responsible for the use or misuse of my imagination. Do you recall seeing on TV a dramatized version of the sinking of the Titanic? Do you recall it? Have you read the book, A Night to Remember? Well, the book itself is by Walter Lord. But 14 years before the actual harvest of that frightful event of the sinking of the Titanic, a man in England wrote a book. He conceived this fabulous Atlantic liner, and there he built her just like the Titanic. Only the Titanic was not built for 14 years. But he, in his imagination, conceived the liner of 800 feet. She was tri triple screw. She carried 3,000 passengers. She carried few lifeboats because she was unsinkable.
She could make 24 knots. And then one night, he filled her to the brim with rich and complacent people. And on a cold winter's night, he sunk her on an iceberg in the Atlantic. Fourteen years later, the White Star Line builds a ship. She is 800 feet. She is a triple screw. She can make 24 knots. She can carry 3,000 passengers. And she has not enough lifeboats for passengers but she too is labeled unsinkable. She's filled to capacity with the rich, if not complacent, but the rich, because her passenger list was worth in that day when the dollar was 100 cents. $250 million was the worth of the passenger list. Today it would be a billion dollars. All the wealth of Europe and the wealth of this country was sailing on that maiden voyage out of Southampton. Five nights at sea in this wonderful, glorious ship. And she went down on a cold April night on an iceberg. Now that man wrote a book either to get something off his chest because he disliked the rich and the complacent, or he thought it might sell, or he thought, well, this is the means of bringing him a dollar as a writer. But whatever was the motive behind his book, which, by the way, he called futility, to show the utter futility of accumulated wealth. But the identical ship was built 14 years later and carried the same kind of a passenger list and went down in the same manner as the fictional ship. Is there any fiction? There is no fiction. Tomorrow's world is today's fiction. Today's world was yesterday's fiction. The dreams of men of yesteryear. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could talk with someone across space and just use a wire and I couldn't see that one? It would be a mile away beyond the range of my voice. And then maybe five miles and maybe a thousand miles. Mm, fantastic dreams. Then they came true. When they came true, suppose I could do it without the means of a wire. And it came true. Well, suppose now I could do it not just in an audio sense, but in a video sense. Suppose I could be seen. And that came true. But when were they conceived? When they were conceived... They were all fictional, all unreal. There is nothing unreal because God is infinite and God has finished creation. You cannot conceive of something that your father has not only done and conceived of it, it is worked out in detail in all its ramifications. You and I are only becoming aware of increasing portions of that which already is. We're not making a thing. We are discovering God's wonderful world. But now in this church, at least here, it should be done. For this is a church of the mind. This is science of mind. Where there is a science to planting and you do it in a certain scientific manner. You just don't walk the street and reflect, read the papers and reflect. You go out a more positive person than people who gather in similar areas. For the simple reason, they just go to hear a service and be told how bad the world is. You're not coming here to be told how bad the world is. For if you believe it is bad, there is something you must do about it because you have planted the world. You have your seed time. So here people gather to be told how to operate this wonderful gift that the Father gave them. There is this wonderful mind and imagination. So you are told to go out and be choosy in your selection. Single out that aspect of reality to which you want to respond. Success, health, dignity, nobility, something wonderful that you contribute to the good of the world. As you walk by, you are contributing to society. 
You contribute to the community in which you live, not necessarily by giving dollars, but you contribute by your wonderful seed time. If in your community you see the need of maybe a church, you see the need of some wonderful school, you don't wait until people get together. You actually, in your mind's eye, contemplate the joy that is yours because of the wonderful school here for the children, a wonderful church here to lift man spiritually. And you wonder what it would be like were it true. You feel the thrill of witnessing it within. That is seed time. Then in a way that you do not know and you need not labor to produce, you will encounter that school and that church and these lovely things in your community. So you plant the seed and let others who think that they are bringing it into being, let them think so. You go about this world planting the good. That is why you are here. We are gathered here on Sunday mornings to discover more and more about this wonderful gift that God gave us, that we may single out all the lovely things in the world and bring them to birth in our world. This morning, or this evening, you take not only yourself, start with self, then turn to a friend in your mind's eye and congratulate him on his good fortune. Congratulate him on his expansion in his world and actually feel the thrill of such contact. At that moment of response, that was a changed attitude in regard to that friend. At that moment, you planted. Now, in a way, you do not know, and you need not know, that seed is going to go through its normal, natural, hidden passage and appear as a reality in your world. Then you will know the power latent within you, and you will stop reflecting life, and you will become one, what I call a true creator, in the sense that I mean creator, that you are creating by selecting wise, wise, lovely things in this world and giving them expression in this world of ours. So that's what I mean by seed time and harvest. The importance of the right attitude. You can do it. You need not wait for circumstances to change. You need not wait for the stimulus of a change in the object to produce in yourself the change of attitude. In your office, does the boss act in a rude way towards you? Well then, what would it be like if he now saw in me the lady, the helpful person that I really am or want to be. Suppose he saw in me someone he could praise for my work and raise me in the salary world, give me an increase in salary because of my added effort. Suppose he could see that in me. Well, contemplate the boss seeing that in you as though he saw it and rewarded you with an increase. That moment, is the moment of planting. It may not come tonight. It may not even come this week in the paycheck, but it will come. You simply keep on planting the lovely things. But if every day when you leave the office, you say, eh, what a skin flint, and you go home and you discuss him with your mother or your husband or someone else, and they sympathize because they really believe you, for they're playing the same reflective negative approach to life. But if as you ride home or walk home, you walk in the attitude that he has done it, he had increased your income, he had praised your work, and day after day, in spite of other things to the contrary, you persist in it. Do you know? He will do it. You will produce in him the change of heart because you first produced it in yourself. And he will see in you qualities that he cannot now see. And then your whole vast world begins to blossom. You do it in every sense of the word. We, if you know someone who is lonely, one who really should be happily married in this world. Well, what would it be like if you were told, not by the individual necessarily, but by a third party of the good news concerning John, concerning Mary or someone else? someone desirous of a lovely home and a gracious home. What would it be like 
Don't be envious. Try to rejoice. Feel the joy that is theirs at that moment. And in that moment, it is seed time for them. They will harvest it. And that is our opportunity to go through the world planting and planting wisely. Now, unfortunately, too many of us in church movements, I don't think you will find it in this church, but too many of us in church movements have a very serious attitude towards life. And of course, the basic attitude is the attitude towards life, not necessarily the individual attitude towards an object or towards an individual, but the attitude itself that the individual adopts through life, towards life, and they have a very serious one. Well, Orage very wisely and very humorously said, the serious attitude is this. They really believe that God has an enormous struggle against helpless odds. And he said that this produces in the individual the emotion of helping poor father. They go to help poor father who has created the world and gave it to his children. Now he brought up another interesting point of the scientific attitude towards life. Having discovered the little molecule or the little atom and the wonderful construction that is theoretically having discovered this wonderful orderly construction of the bricks that make up the world, their attitude is one of orderly insignificance because they believe the world is gradually burning itself out. So no matter how orderly it is, if they really believe the sun will eventually go out and the earth will consume all its resources, what other attitude could they adopt than all dressed up with nowhere to go? Because eventually it is all going to be in nothing anyway, no matter how orderly it is today. It could only be orderly insignificance. But I tell you, as one who has seen beyond the veil, there's no such thing as coming to an end. Life is forever and forever and forever. And forever you are moving up this everlasting pilgrimage, revealing the infinite glories of your father. So go out wisely today. Go out determined to become more selective, more discreet in your choice of ideas you will entertain. And single out the idea that would bless an individual and produce in yourself the emotional response that you have witnessed that state in his world and know that at that moment of response, you planted for that individual and he is rooted in you. There's no such thing as he will not be found in your world for he is rooted in you. Everyone is rooted in you. Therefore, you will not lose them. It is planted relative to that being and that being is going to harvest it. And you will know the harvest when it appears in his world. You simply plant and let the harvest take care of itself. <laughs> what a most beautiful lecture. Dare I say, I must take my own mind and control it. I must take my wonderful imagination and actually control it and set it to noble purposes and not some intermediary. You don't let some intermediary come between myself and God. For the God of this world is an internal God. He is that inevitable force that expresses in outward facts the latent tendencies of the soul. And so if I would discover that God, I cannot have you do my work for me. I cannot have you eat my spiritual food and expect to grow spiritually. So that is really the attempt of the nine chapters in the book Seed Time and Harvest. It's in my it's in there somewhere in one of my playlists. But tonight do you hear what he said to you? You must Learn to control 
your own mind. And notice how we don't control it by force. We control it by way of imagination. You control it by way of imagination. Whatever that thing is, he says, that you want to experience. Well, put your attention upon it. And he says, something happens to you when you think about it. You have a, an actual emotional response. As within, so without. The thing felt on the inside is the thing experienced on the outside. So you see, there is no fiction. I wonder how many movie trailers you've seen. <laughs> there is no fiction. You see, you are writing the script of your life. You see, if you think about it, this is where scripting comes in. It's not that scripting is a technique. It is that you are the author. And what does an author do? An author writes. So he writes a story that he wants to experience. That is what scripting is. Write the story and the way you want to tell it. So the next time you say to yourself, because he didn't mention if you know somebody who wants to be married. So we'll go there with the SP. I'm sure some of us have read romance novels. I've read plenty in my day. What kind of love affair would you like to experience in your life? Well, then write the romance. Write it. Immerse yourself in it. But you see, most of us don't even know what we want in a romance, do we? If you can't put it on paper, if you can't write it out to get clarity, that's what he's telling you to do. Become clear. But that takes control of your mind to stay focused on what you're writing. But you're not just writing it. As you write it, every word you write evokes an emotion within you. I entered the room and there he was, standing in the corner, just lightly leaning against the wall, as if he were hiding behind that giant flower, not wanting to be seen. But he caught my eye. And there, as if he knew I was looking at him, he looked at me and our eyes made for that connection. So what more could a girl do? I slowly made my way over to where he was standing. You see, write the story. Write the story. What do you want to experience? It doesn't always have to be a romance, but, you know, we all want a little love, right? So write the story. One of my favorite things, you know how they had those old detective movies? Uh, and uh, they'd be in black and white, and you'd see the word private investigator written on the door. And the woman would walk in. Well, such and such has suggested that I come to see you because I've lost this person and I don't know who they are. I don't know where they've gone to. Can you help me? Mm-hmm. Write the story. You're looking for that long lost friend. You see, there's... Be creative with life. It is a beautiful thing, you know. So tonight, as you rest your head on your pillow, tell your story. Oh, we're very good storytellers, aren't we? Girl, let me tell you. Let me tell you something, Linda. You'd never guess what they did to me. Oh, we're very good storytellers. And we embellish for effect. If you could have heard this heifer and what she said. <laughs> we're storytellers. So, why don't you practice? Hmm? Practice. You're not writing for the... Listen. Write for you, and heaven knows what you would bring about. So, uh, A.M. Amani. Hello, Jerry Don Quixote. Oh, Cyber and Rone, you're here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. At least you're the ones who've made yourselves known. Wait, A.M. said something. 
<laughs> yes, I did do it two years ago. Um, and she said, I was pondering that day what you read tonight. I caught myself and I said, you're the creator. This is the creation. Oh, you see? You see what she did? She caught herself. Well, you never know. Hey, my money. I might, listen, I might just write it. You just never know. I tend to dabble. Who's on fan base tonight? Matthias is here. Flo smiles. I am that deal. Fawn, Miss Deborah. Uh, Miss Cherry is here. Honey, hey. <laughs> it is good to see you all here tonight on fan base. Listen, I trust tonight that this lecture has reminded you of what you are capable of. And it has aroused within you. So you will test it out for yourselves. See? Test it. So you got just, just test it out for yourself. Okay? That's all. Because that's what he said. He said, you plant it, but you don't have to labor. Now, that's my kind of work, where I don't have to labor. <laughs> I don't have to labor. I just have to get in the state, embody the state, and it unfolds, and I act according to the unfoldment. Well, as you rest tonight, my beautiful friends, rest in the awe. And if you were like me today and you <clears throat> reacted to something, well, revise. How would you would how would you have preferred to have acted? Play that instead and revise it. As I was reading that lecture, I saw why I reacted the way I did. This was the harvest of something I had planted previously. Like maybe four weeks ago, I planted it. And today I was like, as I was reading this, I was like, ah oh, shoot. So revise. See it the way you want to see it, hear it the way you want to hear it. And you'll change. Think about that. Be encouraged, my beautiful friends, to know that plant the seed. He told you what seed time was. Your emotional response to something. So you have an attitude. And it has an emotional response in you. You planted a seed. Right? So that's how you know you've planted a seed. The attitude brought out an emotion within you. You could feel it. You planted the seed. Now you've got to reap it. See? So, anywho, don't let me keep you. What you saying, Cyber? Cyber says he listened to my recording of Walk on the Water from four years ago. Wow. He says I'm a true OG. <laughs> to the Neville Goddard. <laughs> to the Neville Goddard YouTube game. Well, listen. Oh, what's wrong with you? What you saying? Hmm? Oh, itty bitty. Itty bitty says good night, everyone. Um. Yes. Countdown initiated. Five, four, three, two, one. Rest well, everyone. I love you. Plant beautiful seeds. Reap a beautiful harvest. Mm. That's it.